Sounds like we very so um good afternoon everybody. Um thank you for joining us for our Monty Hart Friday lecture. Uh, as you know, we do these lectures every two weeks on a general cardiology topic and the alternate weeks we do it on CT, MRI and imaging run by Leandro. Uh, so please join us for those. And you know, if you need to cut out or anything happens, remember, we will put this lecture on our Monty Hart YouTube channel. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce um, Dr. Mark Manigas, who I consider now a very close friend. Uh, I've only known him for a short time, um, but in that short time, I've come to respect you in an incredible way, Mark, uh, for your depth of knowledge and dedication to our field. So for those of you who don't know Mark, uh, he's a professor of medicine here at Monte and Albert Einstein, and he's the director of our cardiac cath lab at Einstein as well. Um, Mark's had a long history at Monty, has been here a long time, and thanks to him, uh, we have, you know, very great relationships with our emergency department. We have great collaborations on how to really streamline and manage our patients with acute coronary syndromes, especially, especially STEMI. Mark's not just a plumber like I am, um, but he's actually a great clinician too, um, and has directed you know, the coronary care unit here. Uh, he's still at, at Moses for a number of years. Uh, he still continues to work actively in the CCU, uh, looking after patients clinically, teaching our house staff, nurses and fellows. Um, you, his history in acute coronary syndromes goes back really to the early 80s when Mark uh, has done a lot of research in acute coronary syndromes, uh, including the early days of thrombolysis, angioplasty. He's been involved in the TIMI trials, in the shock trial, and many trials that now really dictate how we manage acute coronary syndromes. So, Mark, we couldn't think of anybody else really in at Monty to ask to talk to us about acute coronary syndromes because you just have such a wealth of experience and have been really so deeply involved in this area. So thank you for taking the time today. We're all looking forward to, to hearing your lecture on acute coronary syndromes and having a, a 2020 update. Thank you, Azim, for that very kind uh, introduction. I just want to remind everybody uh, on a sad note, we want to recall that today is 9-11. It's the 19th anniversary of the attacks on our country, and we should never forget this. Um, you know, ceremonies are going on as we speak, but uh, Let's bear that in mind. We lost thousands of people today, 19 years ago. Um, I want to move through this. Unfortunately, we have to move kind of quickly. I'm going to be covering quite a bit of information because this is the only lecture that really deals with uh, coronary syndromes in the, in the series. So we're going to talk about, besides basic pathophysiology, a series of different types of patients. And I really want to cover the new guidelines that, were, that just came out literally a week ago from the European Society. So we have quite a bit of stuff to cover. I'm gonna move a little bit quickly, but, and I will try to leave time for questions if I can answer them. So for the clinical view of ACS, we really need three things. We need the ECG, we need the troponin values, and we need to put our brains into the, uh, into the mix to try to come up with what the diagnosis is and how to take care of these particular patients. ACS, acute coronary syndrome non-STEMI presentation, usually requires a prolonged or resting angina, um, destabilization of stable angina or post-MI angina. And we define that by the, cardi the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, Index, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but just to remind you, class one patients basically have no limitation with ordinary activity, whereas class four patients have angina at rest are unable to carry out any physical activity. And then there's variations in between. So changes in these classes dictate a change in the anginal pattern and in the, in the uh, presentation of acute coronary syndromes. So to give you an example, this is a gentleman that has known 3VD, three vessel disease and left main stenosis waiting for surgery and sitting in the hospital at rest. This was his ECG having chest pain. You can see the very marked ST depressions throughout the entire ECG, as well as the elevations in AVR, which would indicate, you know, again, 3VD or left main. There's the baseline and there's the, the ECG uh, with symptoms. So this is resting angina or angina decubitus. So when patients present to our emergency rooms, the differential diagnosis for chest pain 
literally half of them have non-cardiac causes. And we have to keep that in mind because we have to call out the people that are sicker. So of those people, a small percentage present as a STEMI or an ST elevation MI, but many do come in with non-STEMIs or other cardiac etiologies of chest pain, which are serious. And when I say serious, I mean things like pericarditis, myocarditis, tach tachyarrhythmias, hypertensive emergencies. Most of these non um, other cardiac but non-coronary um, etiologies also have troponin elevation. So we have to be able to pick them out from these folks who may need to go to the cath lab sooner. But eventually, most of these patients require an invasive evaluation as well. What we put into place back in the early 1990s was something that looks like this, which hangs up in both emergency rooms. <clears throat> and it's our triage policy. So patients coming in with chest pain, pressure, heaviness, um, or nausea, vomiting, and sweating with a cardiac history or syncope, or patients that are coming in with unexplained shortness of breath or tachyarrhythmias are triaged to get an ECG within 10 minutes. And it's casting a very wide net, obviously, not all these patients are going to have cardiac disease. But if we don't do that wide net, we miss people. And that's what was happening before we put this into place. So this captures the patients. And then we can throw them back if we have the small fish that don't fit. But the big ones, we're not going to miss if we do this. So just to show you that the EKG can also be, be very diagnostic, but sometimes depending on how you read it, this was a patient who was short of breath and having chest pain. And the clinician insisted that we take this patient to the cath lab because he must have an LAD lesion, look at the ECG. So yes, he does have T-wave inversions across the precordium, but if you look carefully at these inversions, they're not symmetric, they're asymmetric. Okay, so this is not really a Wellens sign. And if you look at the frontal axis of this cardiogram, it's rightward. A rightward axis in an adult is never normal, okay? So what's the verdict here? Yes, he's short of breath. Yes, he's having chest pain. This patient had a very large pulmonary embolus. Okay, so the, the EKG can help us make these diagnoses, but we shouldn't get fooled by it either. So when I tell the fellows to be careful because there are non-cardiac etiologies of acute chest pain, they're also serious. And they include things like aortic dissection and what we just saw, pulmonary embolus, pneumothorax, and stuff like that. So the physical examination and the chest X-ray actually become very important here. And as I tell the guys and, and, and women, less than 90 minutes to door to balloon time is incredibly important, but it's also very important not to miss the ventricular septal rupture, the stroke, the acute abdomen, the DNR, the glucose of 800. Those are things that if you are going very quickly in the emergency room, you're not gonna pay attention to. And we're gonna get stuck with, with the patient who's got something that we, we shouldn't be taking to the cath lab. Okay, so let's go through anatomy and types of MI. In, in terms of presentation of non-STEMI ACS, remember that up to 20% of these patients have either no lesions or no obstructive lesions, but of the ones that do, many of them uh, have multivessel disease. Defining the types of MI, this was done in the, in the fourth universal definition of MI, we need two things. We need to have a rise and a fall in troponin values above the 99th percentile, so at least one value above that. And we need to have at least one of the following, and those following include symptoms of myocardial ischemia or ECG changes, new Q waves, or a loss of myocardium that's viable either on an echo or in some sort of an imaging study. So you need to have both of these things, not just the troponin elevation, but also a symptom or a change. Recently, a reclassification was suggested for types one and two MI to include things that normally were in type twos to put them into type ones. And the reason for that is because type one is considered really a supply problem. The classic MI of, of either plaque rupture or erosion with thrombus reduces the supply, but so does dissection, which can be a scan. Um, coronary embolism and so forth and vasospasm, whereas demand problem or a type two uh, can be done with either, can happen with either a fixed lesion or even somebody without particular stenosis at all, but say put under a stressful situation like profound anemia. It's important to differentiate infarction from injury, okay, and, and why is that? Everybody that has a myocardial infarction obviously has myocardial injury, but not everybody with injury has an infarction. 
Okay, so patients that have a troponin elevation and symptoms you know, uh, that go along with that or loss of myocardium have had an MI. But clearly we see a lot of patients in this outer circle. And what causes the outer circle? Lots of things. Profound anemia, that fast rhythms, hypoxemia, hypotension and shock, heart failure. All the things that we see in ICUs can give us troponin elevations, but don't necessarily mean the patient has obstructive coronary disease or had a myocardial infarction. And it's important to classify that. So if you put it in another way, if we look at troponin rise and fall with evidence of ischemia, then we definitely have acute myocardial infarction. And we're either going to classify it as a type 1 or a type 2. A rise and fall in troponin, but without evidence of ischemia, is acute myocardial injury. And what, what situations give you that? Acute heart failure, myocarditis. And finally, stable but elevated levels of troponin is chronic injury. And we see that very frequently in chronic kidney disease in patients presenting with, uh, for instance, very severe aortic stenosis. So is a high sensitivity troponin a boon or a bust? Um, I you hear the term, especially on rounds, troponinemia, troponinitis, the patient's got troponin leak, this and that. Those are not diseases, okay? That's not a diagnosis. Troponin I or troponin T comes from only one place, the heart, okay? And it has adverse prognostic implication if it's elevated. The fact that we now have high sensitivity, high sensitivity troponin has, has allowed us to reclassify a lot of things as now type two MIs or even myocardial injury. Unfortunately, as I found out, our new troponin uh, assay that we have here at Montefiore, which is now troponin I, is not a high sensitivity assay. That's coming probably in 2021. I just spoke to Jim Fakes about it. So <clears throat> just to show you how this works, this is the, a series of patients from the third universal definition of MI. And in the fourth universal definition of MI, the, the actual MI numbers have dropped. The reason for that is because these patients have been reclassified. And many of them, some, some of them have peeled off and gone to chronic injury or acute injury. But look what's happened here. Non-cardiac chest pain or cardiac chest pain that's non-coronary, many of these have now been reclassified as chronic injury because of high sensitivity troponin, okay? So why does that become important? It becomes important when you look at this. So here's a series of 47,000 odd patients that presented to emergency rooms in Scotland and had troponins drawn. Most of the patients in the green bar had negative troponins, so they're fine. The folks that had positive troponins were then classified into types one or two MI, acute or chronic injury. Type 1 MI we're familiar with, it's a STEMI, go to the cath lab, get the vessel opened, et cetera. Here's the, the cardiovascular death rate, I'm trying to find my arrow here, and here's the all-cause mortality, okay, which we kind of what we expect. Type 2 MIs we're seeing similar but a little more in the, in the uh, all-cause mortality. But look here, okay, look in the chronic injury and look in the acute injury. The death rates here are actually extraordinarily high, and they're higher than here, okay? So what is this telling us? This is not acute myocardial infarction, but these patients are sick. They have underlying illnesses which are leading to myocardial injury, and they frequently die from those things, not necessarily cardiac disease, but the cardiac involvement, meaning the troponin elevation, is a marker for illness. And obviously, the higher your troponin is, the worse your prognosis is. So if you're just above the 99th percentile, you might have a small troponin elevation because of a small MI or a cardiomyopathy. But as it gets larger and larger, these are bigger and bigger MIs, stress cardiomyopathy, critical illness, and so forth. And these patients are sicker. In Chapman's series of following 522 cases over five years of myocardial injury, the MACE and cardiovascular death rates were extraordinarily high over five years. So we're dealing with a very morbid condition. And don't forget our friend COVID. COVID has been a big problem for us, as, as we all know, um, and it can lead to lots of things, including a classic MI with plaque rupture, but also supply demand problems. We know that it really now is a vascular disease and it can lead to microthrombi and micro myocardial dysfunction. And finally, stress cardiomyopathy. We've seen all these things in the months of March, April, and May. 
And if you look at this little study, not so little, but this study from Italy, uh, who they were hit first before we got it, patients that came in with COVID and had troponin elevations tended to be older and have more cardiovascular comorbidity, but their mortalities were three times this, the rate of folks that had normal troponin elevation. So having a positive troponin in a patient with COVID is a very bad prognostic sign, at least in this Italian study and certainly in our hands as well. So there's two ongoing trials looking at what's happening with injury, the demand MI trial and the ACT2 trial. This is in the UK. This is in Australia. Results to follow. We don't have anything yet. So let's go quickly back to basics because I want you to understand where we're coming from in terms of pathophysiology. Um, <clears throat> so dealing with plaque rupture, whether there's acute inflammation or less inflammation, and then plaque erosion. We're going to go into this in a little more detail. So this is the classic picture that you've seen um, for atheromous disease involving the, uh, the intima of the blood vessel. Obviously, LDL is transporting in. It's being picked up by monocytes. They turn into foam cells, and then they can become ap apoptotic, and lipid droplets are forming and, and allow, allowed to form within this, this space, and they can actually they can actually form cholesterol crystals. Cholesterol crystals are very inflam inflammogenic, if I can make up a word, um, as, as are apoptotic bodies from these breakdown of macrophages. And the inflammasome is now revved up. So what is the inflammasome? The inflammasome is a three-part protein. It's, it consists of a nod-like receptor protein, an adapter protein, and then a procaspase, uh, which is, they're all attached. Once the, once the revving up starts to occur from these stimulatory processes here, the, uh, the nod-like receptor protein oligomerizes, you know, starts to grow on itself, recruits more of the uh, adapter protein, and then it cleaves procaspase to caspase. Caspase then allows release of active inflammatory mediators, IL-1B IL IL and IL-18, and this is, this is what leads to an active plaque. Okay, which can then begin to degrade and, 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 and rupture. Drugs that we use, such as statins and azetamide, actually interfere with cholesterol crystal formation. So they're actually beneficial in terms of being anti-inflammatory, besides lowering cholesterol. So <clears throat> you've all seen this, but just to show you the sort of differentiation between ruptured plaque and eroded plaque, ruptured plaque tends to have a thin cap, a, a, a large lipid pool, and many macrophages. And it has different collagenases and different matrix metalloproteinases than patients that have eroded plaque, where the thrombus tends to be more platelet-rich and white, more, pro more proteoglycans, very little lipid core, and a lot more neutrophils and NETs, which we're going to talk about in a few moments. And again, different collagenases, different mixed metal matrix metalloproteinases. So to show you an, an OCT picture of that, optical coherence tomography, this is an OCT picture showing a plaque rupture and then juxtapose that with eroded plaque, which is seen here with thrombus adherent to it. And this is a large amount of thrombus adherent to an eroded plaque. This is a study done about over 10 years ago now by Greg Stone's group. And um, looking at patients that came in with a, a culprit lesion and then having um, tissue characterized ultrasound of the other vessels as well and, and, and characterizing the plaque seen in those other vessels. Turns out that in terms of MACE rates over, uh, over the three-year period, which was about 20%, the culprit lesions and the non-culprit lesions had very similar event rates. And most of the, cul the non-culprit lesions were actually not severe angiographically, they were mild. But if you look at them histologically with this sort of pseudo histological technique, the patients that had more amount of thin cap fiber atheroma, greater plaque burden and smaller minimal lumen areas had much higher event rates. So you're able to predict by looking just at this histologically, pseudo histologically, I'm not, I'm not being facetious, it's not a hist histology study, but it's an ultrasound study. But looking at this in vivo, one could predict um, poor outcomes based on the amount of these characteristics in these plaques. What, what leads to plaque erosion? The factors that, that lead to uh, loss of endothelial cells 
um, require a two-hit hypothesis. So the, the first hit is denudation of the cells and then creating a bare um, basement membrane and then coagulation starting, uh, starting on that bare basement membrane using the neutrophil as part of its process to fibrin formation. And we'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So what causes that? Possibly the cells themselves can become apoptotic and lost as, uh, from the basement membrane. Or we now have, as we know, in, especially in the eroded patients, and we showed this a few slides back, uh, type 4 collagenases, the uh, matrix metalloproteinases, which actually serve like a pair of scissors and clip off these basement membrane collagens that allow the cells to flow freely off and leave a bare basement membrane. What happens then, neutrophils are a big part of this, and as they begin to extrude their contents, um, these are called NETs or neutrophil extracellular traps, the um, they are really quite stimulatory to a number of processes, <clears throat> including um, the uh, development of mature IL-1, which is quite inflammatory, the creation of hypochlorous acid, and also the recruitment of tissue factor, which then leads to the clotting cascade, you know, cleaving prothrombin to thrombin and then fibrinogen to fibrin. So laying down a fibrin mesh and causing a thrombus. So, you can, you can see how this act, the sequence activates quickly um, with an eroded plaque. The question is, can these plaques heal or they, does this always lead to some sort of a coronary event? It depends on the sort of the seesaw between activation and passivation. So the, it is possible for plaques to heal. We know that. And healing requires thrombolysis, which is an endogenous process, granulation, and then re-endothelialization. So Again, it's a two-hit hypothesis, the first hit being um, superficial erosion or plaque rupture. And then if you're unlucky, you then create a thrombus, which then become, can become occlusive or not occlusive, but leading to an acute coronary syndrome. If you're fortunate and you have very good endogenous TPA, you can actually lyse this, stabilize it, and begin to heal. And then you end up with a chronic coronary syndrome. So to put that all together just quickly, we look at plaque instability versus plaque healing. So in the, in the unstable portion of this, <clears throat> we have um, T1 helper cells, which can connect to and stimulate M1 uh, macrophages, which then give off these mixed metalloproteinases, which are not only procoagulant, but also cause degradation of collagen and breakdown of smooth muscle cells leading to plaque instability and then thrombosis. On the opposite side, T2 helper cells communicate with the M2 macrophages, which are scavengers, but they also can secrete interleukin-10, which is actually anti-inflammatory as well as fibronectin, and actually go on to cause osteoblast formation and creation of calcium deposits, which can stabilize the plaque, okay? And then lead also to smooth muscle proliferation and increased collagen production. So it's two different systems, but they, they are interchangeable. And what actually happens or what can happen, which is quite interesting, is that the phenotypes of these two systems, the inflammatory and the less inflammatory, can switch. So these are not dedicated cells. They can be switched back and forth. And the current research that's going on is to try to develop drugs and, and interventions that can cause that switch to lead to a, a less inflammatory phenotype and stabilize plaque. So I think it's it's an interesting area. And uh, Crea, who's now in Rome, and, and I see Peter Libby have been doing a lot of work in this area. So keep an eye out for this. In fact, Crea just came out with a very, very good article, uh, which I referenced here, um, which you should read, just came out last week about plaque healing in the New England Journal. Very, very well done article. OK, let's move on to some clinical work. Um, risk stratification and management for acute coronary syndromes and non-STEMI. So we have, and we're going to go through this a few times, but very high risk criteria for patients would include things like cardiogenic shock, life-threatening arrhythmias, and mechanical MI complications. High risk complications, high risk criteria, uh, dynamic ECG changes, and a high GRACE score, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. And then finally, we have intermediate risk criteria. Why, why do we have to differentiate that? This is the money slide. This is the one we got to pay attention to. So patients presenting, say, to our ERs, which is a, PI, a PCI center, 
that come in with very high risk criteria that we just talked about, like shock or life-threatening arrhythmias or you know, profound ST changes that are dynamic, those patients should be treated just like a STEMI. They need to go to the cath lab immediately, less than two hours, have an invasive workup and invasive evaluation and treatment. So it's basically a very STEMI-like mode and we should do that on a routine basis. The high risk patients, not the super high risk, but the high risk ones with the higher grade scores, uh, resuscitated arrest and so forth, should have an early invasive strategy, less than 24 hours. And we're actually pushing to that end. So if you come in on a Saturday morning and you have this, by Sunday morning, you should have your anatomy taken care of and, you, and, your, and your situation stabilized. Lower risk patients can be treated either selectively invasively or not invasively. And obviously if you're in a non-STEMI center or a non-PCI center, then these patients, the high risks get transferred and we expect those. This is the GRACE score. GRACE has been around a long time now. It's a global registry of acute cardiac events. It's available on MD Calc, as are a lot of the things I'm going to show you. So you can put it on your phone and you can use it to uh, calculate um, what the death rate is in six months from admission. So it, it takes into account a number of things like age, prior MI, blood pressure, heart rate, and so forth, and calculates them. The knee of the curve really starts to happen around 140. So below 140, these are tend to be lower risk patients and above 140, higher risk patients, okay? The um, lower risk patients can be managed non-invasively and that's a, that's a class one indication. And that's actually changed a little bit from 2015 to 2020. So here they were discussing multi-detector coronary angiography uh, as a yellow, meaning, you know, possible. Now it's got a green uh, in 2020. So CCTA is recommended as an alternative to invasive angiography um, to exclude ACS in low risk patients, okay? Um, also one could use stress testing, which we certainly do here as well, stress echoes and so forth. But this is actually a, a green recommendation and a good one that just came out literally this week. So. For non-STEMI patients, uh, acute, acute coronary syndrome, you basically, the invasive approach has a green light in all cases. It's just depending on the speed of how fast you're gonna get there. Super high risk, less than two hours. High risk, 24 hours. Lower risk, you have a few days, you can make that decision or you can go non-invasive. Okay, the other uh, scoring system that's available that's very old now but works is a very simple arithmetic system using points of one point each for each of these factors developed by Elliot Antman back in 2000. And um, it's, uh, it's easy to use at the bedside. So it's something you can put in your head almost and use uh, when you're seeing a patient in the emergency room. But any of these factors adds a point and how you use this is tells you if the patient is gonna have either a mortal event, a new or recurrent MI or recurrent ischemia within the next two weeks. So lower risk patients have about a 4% risk of that, moving all the way up to 10 times that or 40% if you have all six or seven um, criteria that you meet. And again, that's on MD Calc. You can put that on your phone as well. So it becomes important with these patients to do imaging and the imaging uh, is not only what we do at the bedside like an echo, but also intracoronary imaging where we're trying to understand the plaque event or what's happened with this particular patient. So here's a case that actually the ACS, um, the ESC actually provided some cases with this current go around were very interesting uh, the way they did that. And so I put some of these into the talk, but there's a 65 year old that came in with hypertension as a history, but now he has acute heart failure, he's in pulmonary edema, and it has an ECG that's absolutely horrifying with again, diffuse ST segment depressions and elevations in AVR. So the pesky internal medicine resident comes to you and says, should this guy get immediate angiography? And your answer, and again, his Timmy score is high also. Again, your answer is yes, he has very high risk criteria, acute heart failure, and he's got an ECG which suggests left main or three vessel disease. This patient should get an immediate invasive strategy, be treated just like a STEMI. Okay, but we have gaps in the evidence. When we have multivessel disease with acute coronary syndromes, we don't really know what the best revascularization strategy should be. Should it be cabbage? Should it be PCI or some combination of those things? Those trials haven't been done. So basically the recommendations are based on 
the trials of stable ischemic uh, heart disease and STEMI, but we kind of do it the same way. Let's go quickly, but talk about the clotting cascade a little bit because we need to, because of the drugs that we're using to treat this condition uh, also affect this. So the drugs that we're currently using affect the ADP receptor, and those drugs include clopidogrel, prosergil, and ticagrelor, and then our basic our friend aspirin, which interferes with thromboxane A2. What we're trying to do is to prevent platelet aggregation, okay? So we, we wanna stop that platelet workstation from, from forming so that it's a place for fibrin to then form and, and cause a clot. We hardly use these drugs anymore because we don't really need them. They, they promote bleeding more than anything at this point, and we have drugs that work just as well orally. We also give anticoagulants. As you know, we have, we have oral anticoagulants that we use chronically, um, and obviously unfractionated heparin, which interferes with thrombin. So we're hitting the clotting cascade, both from the, um, the uh, clotting point of view and the platelet point of view uh, to try and interfere with it and acute coronary syndromes. So all the P2Y12 inhibitors have a type one or a class one indication for uh, ACS. Important to know that clopidogrel, which is the one that's been around the longest and obviously the least expensive, also has a delayed onset of action of about two to six hours. So <clears throat> the current iteration of giving these drugs in the cath lab, it really is, comes down to prosergil or ticagrelor, which have a much more rapid onset of action. Okay, a bunch of platelet trials were done just recently, Trilogy, Plato, and Triton, uh, looking and comparing these, these various agents. And that's how these recommendations came about for the current uh, iteration of ACS. So Prostagil and Ticagrelor are now considered to be the drugs of choice. Clopidogrel or Plavix is also a, a class one indication, but it's felt to be, should be used when these other drugs are not available or can't be tolerated. There's a couple of controversial recommendations, which I'm going to uh, talk about for a second. Um, one is that the ECS is now pushing Prosegil as the preference drug in, in all acute non-STEMI patients uh, when they're going to the cath lab for PCI. This is based on one trial, the ISAR REACT trial, which was a single trial and open label. So there's a lot of critique of this recommendation and uh, I, I'm not sure that I buy this. It's, it's also a yellow. But the one that does make sense and it's in a big fat red is this one, not preloading these patients with a P2Y12 inhibitor in the emergency room. And the reason for that is because the drugs that are available, these two, can be loaded rapidly in the cath lab once you know the anatomy and the risk of bleeding is a lot lower if you don't, if you don't preload. So this data actually does make some sense. Um, but it's important to remember this does not apply to STEMI patients. STEMI patients do need to be preloaded because they're going to definitely have an angioplasty no matter what. Okay, so we need to assess a few things. We need to assess bleeding risk and, and risk of thrombosis. Bleeding risk we can do with a couple of different um, strategies. One is the crusade um, bleeding risk score, which again takes into account series of, of clinical features and then allows you to stratify based on very low to all the way up to high risk of bleeding. And again, it's available on MD Calc, so you can put this on your phone. Lots of things lead to bleeding like anemia, liver disease, renal disease, uh, prior bleeding, NSAIDs, and so forth. So there's many factors that patients come in with, including being elderly, that put them at risk for bleeding, where we may want to consider what we're doing here. If you look at bleeding rates in general in DAPT trials, the dual antiplatelet trials for any PCI, and this is all comers, they're quite low, okay, 0.7 to 2.8%. But this is all comers, not people that necessarily are coming in with acute coronary syndromes per se. How do these things get derived? This is the precise DAP score, which is the most recent one and probably the most useful one. It takes into account five factors, um, again, available for, for use online. And you can see how this was derived, but the biggest, the biggest derivation set here, the one that's the most important is prior bleeding. And that adds the most weight to this, as does creatinine clearance. So when you start adding these things up and looking at the histogram of patients that fall into this, the ones that are at higher risk for bleeding are the ones that score above a 25. So if your precise DAP score is 25 and above, your risk for TIMI minor bleeding or TIMI major bleeding starts to rise dramatically 
and those patients you may want to rethink about. So in those situations, can we shorten the DAPT rather than going for six or 12 months? Can we go to three months of DAPT? Two trials have looked at that, Twilight and Tycho. Um, Twilight was, was done here and in many other uh, Western countries. Um, both of these trials looked at Ticagrelor alone versus Ticagrelor with aspirin after having three months of DAPT. And as it turns out, the um, efficacy rate in terms of reduction of ischemic events was exactly the same in both arms, but the bleeding rates were a lot lower when you didn't give ticagrelor with aspirin. <clears throat> the critique of this one is that only about 60% of the patients really had acute coronary syndromes, whereas all of them did in this trial. This trial was done only in South Korea. So they're important trials, and I think it, it allows us to take some some security in cutting the DAPT, uh, the DAPT duration down, which I'm going to show you briefly. Now, what if we need to extend DAPT? What if we need to give it longer than 12 months? And why would we want to do that? Patients with complex coronary disease and then multiple factors such as multivessel disease, um, lupus, chronic kidney disease, or a very complex anatomy with multiple stents, multiple lesions, left main disease that we've treated, we may want to go longer on DAP with those patients to prevent um, thromboses. Looking at that as a meta-analysis, these six trials um, clearly favors extended DAP, except for bleeding, with, bleeding which, which is obviously lower with aspirin alone versus DAP. But the other things that can occur, such as cardiovascular death and MI, were all lower in the extended DAP area um, in this meta-analysis. So the... Um, the guidelines have given us some leeway to do that by adding either clopidogrel or prasugil to our aspirin therapy, or even in a late, late stage, adding rivaroxaban to aspirin, uh, which was done in the COMPASS trial. If you do choose to use ticagrelor, use a lower dose, okay, because that reduces the bleeding complications. So here's the money slide. This is how we should manage this. So patients that are at very, very high risk for bleeding should have a shortened course of DAP, meaning aspirin and clopidogrel for a month, and then clopidogrel to continue. A high risk for bleeding, and again, you can take this from the precise DAP score, take it from the crusade score, three months of DAP, and then aspirin. What if you have a low risk of bleeding? Then you can go to the more standard 12 months of DAP if you prefer, okay, with any of the combinations, and you can extend that DAP if you want to, uh, again, with either aspirin rivaroxaban or aspirin and one of the thionopyridines past 12 months. Presumably, you're doing that because these patients are at higher ischemic risk, so you're extending the DAPT, or you can just do standard three months and then, and then another continue on with tricagrelor. So this is really the, um, the essence of it. Let's quickly go through STEMI, because I do have to talk about that as part of ACS. Um, the, about 20 to 40% of acute MI presentations are STEMI. Most of them are non-STEMI, okay? And obviously the universal definition has allowed different criteria for um, younger versus older patients in terms of the anterior ST elevation height. Um, but for the other leads that are contiguous, like the inferior leads, it's still greater than or equal to one millimeter. A left bundle branch block alone is not diagnostic of an acute MI. Obviously, we're in a PCI center, so when EMS brings us a patient or a patient walks in with symptoms, we want an ECG within 10 minutes. We want to make that diagnosis, activate the team, and hopefully within less than 60 minutes have a wire crossing that lesion so that we're well under our reperfusion time of, of 60 to 90 minutes. Our strategy here in the emergency rooms is to give aspirin to chew, 160 milligrams, IV beta blockers in, in, in selected cases, and then to preload with either a clopidogrel or a ticagrelor. Um, this is, again, different than non-STEMI. We're, we're now preloading. Heparin bolus is advised, a max of 4,000, and no IV drips. This is what slows the day down. Patients don't need IV anything, okay? If we start IV drips, it slows down the, the transfer process. Okay, so our strategy is still... Um, primary PCI as the default strategy for almost all these cases, even out to 48 hours. Fibrinolysis is certainly available in our hospitals and in outside hospitals, but we prefer to transfer the patient and do PCI as the preferred strategy. And as you get farther and farther out from the initial event, fibrinolysis becomes less useful 
primary PCR remains useful even out to 48 hours if you're having symptoms. So here's a patient, <clears throat> young patient actually presented with this ECG. As you can see, dramatic, uh, significant ST elevations inferior, uh, anteriorly and even a little bit inferiorly, and, and as well as being in heart block. This was her ECG, that's, this was her angiogram. So that's a 41 year old woman actually who was a current smoker, hypertensive. And you can see this LED is loaded with thrombus. This, this loosened stuff is all clot. So we aspirated it. This is what it looks like when you pull it out. Um, and why did we do all this? Well, again, reperfusion is indicated even less than 12 hours with ST elevations, but even later on it's indicated. So if you're, if you're past 12 hours, but having ongoing symptoms, it's still a class one indication to do primary, primary PCI reperfusion. So here's the angiogram after we vacuumed out the clot. Looks pretty good, right? So why did we aspirate the thrombus? It's not, it's against guidelines to do it routinely, but we did it here because there's visible thrombus and we didn't want to, we didn't want to embolize it. So the angiogram looks good. We increased the flow, but are we finished? What's the pathophysiology here? Is this somebody with just a non-obstructive coronary who, who got unlucky, or is this somebody who actually has underlying disease? At 41, you kind of want to know. In anybody, you kind of want to know. So we, we did an IVUS. This is the catheter itself, and this is the, the vessel lumen. And you can see the endothelium down below here is nice and normal. It's a very normal looking artery distally we pull up to where the lesion was, and this is what we saw. So you have an open lumen, but you also have a very large lucent area, which is likely a lipid pool and a, and a fibrous cap, which probably had ruptured at some point and caused this thrombosis, which we saw. So we opted to stent this because we didn't want this to keep happening. And so this is the final product here when we stented this patient. And you can see the pacemaker wire as well. Okay couple of other uh, things to show you. So this is an FDNY activation. Um, you can see there's no name, no nothing on it. So do we call in the team? What's the anatomy? Inferior elevations, lateral elevations, anterior depressions with an early R wave suggest that this may be a posterior wall MI. We call in the team and the patient clearly has very severe um, subtotal circumflex, which was angioplasty relatively quickly and the patient did relatively well. Okay, a couple of other patterns to look at. Um, we have the de Winter pattern, okay, which is uh, showing you evidence of LAD occlusion, but notice that the STs are not up, they're actually down, but the T waves are peaked, okay. This was described in 2008, and we've seen cases of this, so this is actually um, suggestive of acute LAD occlusion. Um, patient here, you can see the primary infarct is, you know, I put a little tombstone here to show you, but what's the significance of these deep depressions anteriorly? These deep depressions tell you that the primary infarct zone is large, that this is a bigger MI and a sicker patient. And that's been seen even in the Duke database many, many years ago. So here, approximate RCA occlusion, which was now opened, um, and the patient did well, very quick door to balloon time. A couple of other mimics. This was a call for STEMI in the emergency room, a 41-year-old man with dyspnea and a fever. I'll show you his old ECG, which is here with an underlying right bundle branch block. And here's the new ECG. And you can see he's got ST elevations, but these are STs are like ski slopes, okay, in V1 and V2. So this, this is Brugada, okay? The influenza A and the temperature of 104 brought out the Brugada pattern. So the patient always has Brugada, but he doesn't always have the, the phenotype. The phenotype shows up when the patient has a fever or a stress situation. Okay, let me skip over RV infarction for now in the interest of time. I just wanna make the point that <clears throat> a normal EKG doesn't mean no disease, but an abnormal EKG doesn't prove disease. If you find a non-diagnostic cardiogram, but continued symptoms, it means leave the stickers on the patient and keep doing the EKG because things change. And EKGs don't cost anything to keep repeating. So here's a case that I'm embarrassed to show you happened in the ER years ago, but patient comes in, known CAD, having chest pain, and this is the ECG that she has. And it looks quite normal because it is quite normal. Okay. They did repeat the EKG about 20, 30 minutes later, and the EKG is still being read as normal because that's what it says up here. But if you look at this ECG and that EKG, they're not the same. So what's the difference? 
These are hyperacute T waves. We hardly ever see this in the setting of acute MI because it happens transiently. But this case, they happened to see it, but didn't recognize it. So the patient didn't go home, fortunately, she got admitted, but they did another EKG. And again, it didn't say STEMI on the top. And some people don't look at this part of the cardiogram. They only look at this part of the cardiogram. So they didn't really pay attention to what was going on here because it didn't say call the doctor until they got this ECG. When they saw this, they got very panicky, called cardiology. And by the time this patient ended up in the cath lab, this was a ECG. Now there's no R waves, T wave inversions across the precordium. And she lost a lot of myocardium and a lot of, uh, and a lot of good function that could have been salvaged. So again, not paying attention to the ECG or not, not allowing it to be read next to the one prior to it um, could cost us. Okay. Here's another example. A young woman comes in, they call the STEMI call on this patient, 35 year old with SLE. Should we take her to the cath lab or not? Well, if you look at this, she has diffuse ST segment elevations, but she has them everywhere, everywhere. And if you look carefully here, we'll see a PR elevation in AVR and a PR depression in AVL. This is consistent with pericarditis, right? There's no vascular territory that explains this kind of an injury current everywhere in the heart, except the pericardium, which covers it. Okay. Um, quickly, just talking about STEMI patients with multivessel disease, there were a couple of smaller studies done in Europe that suggested that fixing the other vessels um, led to a better outcome in terms of reduction of uh, recurrent events. And we showed that finally in the complete trial, which we were part of, uh, it was published last year, <clears throat> this was the first trial of multivessel revascularization in STEMI that actually showed a reduction in death and, and, uh, and recurrent MI. So uh, it's now become the, the standard of care that patients that have multivessel disease with STEMI, you fix the infarct-related vessel at the, at the initial sitting, and then usually on the same hospitalization or within a month or so, you can fix the other vessels as well. One question comes up a lot. My patient's having a STEMI and he takes oral anticoagulation. What should I do? Um, you treat them the same way. They load with aspirin. We get clopidogrel, becomes the drug of choice because the bleeding risk is lower. And we still use anticoagulants unless the INR is greater than 2.5. And radial is the default access. Okay, talk quickly about Minoka and SCAD, okay? As opposed to obstructive coronary disease, patients presenting with chest pain having angiography might also have minimal or no obstructive disease. Okay, and that's what Minoka means. And it involves a number of possibilities, including spasm, um, um, and coronary embolism, and spontaneous dissection. So again, imaging becomes very important here, not only extra coronary, but intracoronary imaging to try to figure out where we are and what we're looking at. Okay, spasm can occur for a couple of reasons. Um, resting smooth muscle cells are, are stimulated by a number of things like histamine and serotonin, which are considered autocoids. They have paracrine effects and they can cause contraction of smooth muscle. And similarly, damaged endothelium or disrupted endothelium because of high, lipid, high lipoproteins and, and the beginnings of atherosclerosis no longer respond appropriately to nitric oxide and don't relax, but actually can um, that actually can, can be part of a, uh, a process of vascular narrowing. So arterial constriction can occur and uh, lead to symptoms. Okay, a small study here, which I'm not gonna spend any significant time on, but patients that came in with uh, no culprit lesion, but spasm tended to do very well clinically, but they continued to have angina despite um, anti-spasm treatment. SCAD is something that we see not infrequently, and um, it tends to be a disease that's primarily in females, usually middle-aged or, or, or younger. Um, and the, uh, the reason that it happens is, is there's two hypotheses, but the outside-in hypothesis has become the more prominent one, where patients actually may have um, bleeding from basal visorum into the, into the adventitial space, which can lead to compression um, of, the, of the lumen and reduction of flow or even occlusion and, and present presentation of an acute coronary syndrome, usually brought on by stress, pregnancy, or very extreme exertion. There's three different types that are seen angiographically. You don't have to memorize all these, but just be aware of it. Um, and the reason that we bring this up is because A, these things can recur. Most of them recover 
spontaneously if they're treated conservatively. So we try not to angioplasty these because they do heal. Um, but we do work these patients up for uh, fibromuscular dysplasia because we don't want to miss patients with cerebral arteriopathy. Okay, and here's a case of a young woman who uh, was um, exercising vigorously and had, had severe chest pain, responded to nitro and then a recurrent chest pain. And the angiogram here shows the RCA, which looks angiographically normal, except that the, the, the continuation of it is almost not seen. And when this was IVIS, you can see there's, a, there's actually a dissection here, a spontaneous dissection. This was treated conservatively, and a month later, you can see that it's healed, and it's open, and it looks fine. Okay, what about the elderly? In very elderly patients, chest pain is still the most frequent symptom until about age 85, and finally, that gets replaced by dyspnea. The classic vomiting and diaphoresis is no longer frequently seen, but you can see syncope, confusion, stroke as, as part of your presentation with the elderly. Um, the treatments basically are done the same way. Um, we, we still apply the same therapies that we do to younger patients, to older patients. Um, there is an ongoing trial called Senior Rita, kind of cute, right? Um, which is through the British Heart Foundation looking at invasive versus non-invasive treatment of elderly patients with acute coronary syndromes. Um, this is not gonna be due out until I retire, so I won't really be able to talk to you about the results. Um, but there is a, a smaller study that was done in the UK called Seniors Non-STEMI, which was retrospective. Um, it took out the patients that were either very likely or unlikely to be cath. So it took sort of the middle ground of patients that were elderly and said, maybe these people are gonna get cath, let's follow them. And um, over the course of three years, the ones that had an invasive strategy had a lower mortality than the ones that were treated medically. Again, it's retrospective, but you know, take it for what it's worth. Okay. Moving on quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the more acute stuff, sudden cardiac death. This was a patient we saw a few years ago here, was playing paddle ball when he had this on a monitor that was brought in by the EMS. He was a school bus driver, very active man, had some, diet, had some uh, risk factors. He had sudden collapse on the paddle ball court. Unfortunately, he was playing with a cop who was able to do CPR, and they shocked him and got him back out of this to return a spontaneous circulation. And he was awake when he got here. This was his EKG when he presented. It looks actually quite normal. There's no ST deviation. There's nothing unusual here. So, and his EKG, his echo was basically normal as well. He had a small troponin elevation, otherwise fine. So what do you do with a guy like this? Well, the CARES registry <clears throat> is a large registry uh, that looked at patients with out of hospital arrest. And of the ones that survived to ROSC uh, got got coronary angiography. The ones that survived to discharge and had a good CPC score, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, um, this seemed to be associated with early angio relatively early angiography and revascularization. Okay, the CPC score is something we use all the time now when we look at our, our comatose patients, but CPC one is somebody with either normal or slightly impaired cerebral performance and CPC two, is someone with moderate uh, disability, but is conscious, is able to potentially work and so forth. The others are severe, comatose, and brain dead. Okay, so we know that the post-arrest ECG alone is not a good predictor of coronary occlusion, and that post-arrest STEMI we take to the cath lab, which we're going to show you in a moment. But what about non? Not, what about a non-STEMI? What about a uh, patient who made some some enzymes like this guy but doesn't have ST elevations? What do we do? So the COAC trial looked at this, 500 something odd patients coming in with a shockable rhythm, but no ST elevations, treated with targeted temperature management, i.e. therapeutic hypothermia, and then either had immediate angiography or within 120 hours had angiography. They looked at survival at 90 days and CPC score. And this was presented by Lemke's uh, in the New England Journal last year, actually, yeah, last year. Um, no difference in the outcomes, whether you had immediate angiography or delayed angiography. And then this was represented at the uh, ACC in November. The one-year outcomes are still exactly the same. So you don't have to kill yourself to get to the cath lab, but you should cath these patients urgently, which is what we did here. So he was cath and he had multivessel disease and a decision was made to proceed with multivessel PCI. We had a first fixed it right. So we basically rebuilt it like a, like a full metal jacket. And that was on 
early in the course. And then a couple of days later, we did the entire left system and then put in ICD. So here's the left system pre. So we fixed the diagonal, the LED, and the other diagonal. You can see this is the final here. And the patient went home. He actually gave us permission to use this picture. But lovely man and his kids, who he drives around on the bus, send him this enormous card that we miss you. Please come back. So here's another patient of mine that, uh, that became mine was talking to a cop outside the hospital and um, had a sudden drop to the ground and a cardiac arrest. He was resuscitated and this was his ECG in the field. Normal tensive, ROSC is returned, so now what do we do? Okay, and this patient was brought in emergently, he was cooled. The uh, guidelines tell us that a patient like this is being is a STEMI and we should be treating him as an acute STEMI despite the cardiac arrest and that we should do targeted temperature management as well, both class one indications. In fact, the ILCOR statement says that targeted temperature management is really the only post-arrest intervention that improves survival. So this patient came in comatose, but you know, cooled, and uh, we opened up his occluded LED. He actually walked out of the hospital in three days, but that's, that's a good case. He was a young guy and he got treated very early. Cardiogenic shock. We have to talk about that as well. Again, here's the horrible ECG with diffuse ST depressions and elevations in AVR, suggestive of this anatomy or left main disease or multivessel disease. So in cardiogenic shock, again, the immediate or emergent PCI of the culprit lesion is indicated. It's not indicated to do the non-culprit lesions and that's based on the culprit shock study, uh, different than what we see in, in routine STEMI. And in terms of mechanical support, we're going to talk about that, but the indications are soft, um, depending. This was from the original shock trial, which we participated in <clears throat> back in the, in the 1990s. And early on, there was no difference in the two uh, arms, whether it were your earlier vascularization or initial medical stabilization, but it broke in about six months and remained different uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the survival rates. So that changed the guidelines in terms of early revascularization. I'm going to skip this and move on to here to show you that we do need to talk about when patients are hemodynamically compromised, meaning a hypotensive tachycardic acidemic, that just fixing the acute, acute coronary problem is not necessarily going to fix the problem. And that if we don't support the blood pressure, unload the ventricle, um, and improve the hemodynamics uh, on both sides of the heart, as well as unloading the, the kidneys and the, and the uh, and the liver, these patients are not going to survive. So we do have mechanical options for treating um, cardiogenic shock, anywhere from the simple balloon pump, which is a good workhorse and it's been around since the 1970s and we use it all the time, to axial flow pumps, which is like the Impella or PHP pump, tandem heart, which we did a lot of here, but we don't do anymore because it's difficult and not as effective as this. And then finally ECMO. The, uh, the ancient basis for the axial flow pump is the Archimedes screw to water your crops, but it works very, very well. You put the same kind of thing in the heart and it sucks the blood out of the LV and into the, uh, into the aorta. And you can get four or five liters of flow out of this thing. Okay, so here's a case from, again, from ESC. So youngish man comes in, uh, tachycardic, um, hypoxic and hypotensive, ECG showing ST depressions, 2, 3, and F. Um, the echo is terrible, you know, global ejection fraction of 30%, and the culprit seems to be the RCA. Um, is there a need for circulatory support in a patient like this? So here he's got an occluded RCA. Here he's got left main disease and diffuse LED and CERT and, and marginal disease. What should we do? A patient like this, yes, he very much does require uh, um, support. What, what you choose to do is obviously uh, what's available in your lab, what you're comfortable with. Um, but a patient like this would benefit from support first, followed by revascularization. And that's actually where things are starting to head with shock. So you, this very busy slide, I don't know what you try to even read it, but this is from Bill O'Neill's work in Detroit and called the Detroit Shock Initiative. And he's trying to sort of get the country to move in this direction so that patients coming in that are hemodynamically compromised, rather than focusing on door to balloon, it's door to support. We get the patient stabilized. We have um, the patient on a device that now supports blood pressure, unloads the ventricle, and then we deal with the occluded infarct-related vessel. 
um, and we have we have um, things that we can look at in terms of our, our support numbers like cardiac power output and what we call the PAPI index, which is the pulmonary artery pulsatility index that we can look at to see how well we're doing with our support. So the, I'm not gonna go through this case, but this is typically what we get from FDNY, which is, I, I call it the Jewish telegram. No name, no data, start worrying details to follow. Um, and, and you get a case like this, it comes in and the patient's in, in cardiogenic shock. Um, and uh, this patient turned out with this anatomy actually had ventricular septal rupture. I'm trying to get to the end of this because the time is running out. So um, post-MI therapy, we really want to stick to guidelines-based medical therapy. And it's very simple if you use the ABCDE method that, came, that, that, um, that Conti came out with years ago, which is A, aspirin and ACE inhibitors, B, beta blockers, blood pressure, C is cholesterol, cigarettes, and clopidogrel, D is diet, and E is exercise education. Very simple. You put that in your head when you're discharging a patient, you make sure you've got all your five bases covered. Okay. Beta blockers, there's little to no evidence if you have preserved ejection fraction post-MI that beta blockers improve lifespan or, or symptoms. Um, from the older trials like Miami that we did back in the 70s and the early 80s, these, but these were sicker patients. They weren't being reperfused. They weren't having angioplasty. It was a whole different ball game. So should these patients be on beta blockers forever? We don't really know the answer, but there is a, an answer coming from the reduced sweetheart trial which is randomizing people to bisoprolol or metoprolol open label, um, following them with preserved ejection fractions, and then seeing you know, beta blocker versus no beta blocker, how do they do? It's due out in about three years, so we'll know the answer. Okay, so the guidelines therapy very quickly, statin, high intensity statin, wanna lower the LDLs to 70 or below. If you have LV dysfunction, ACE inhibitors or ARBs are completely indicated and so are mineralocorticoid inhibitors like spironolactone. The other things that are very important and just as important as the PCI and the meds, get them to stop smoking, kick them when they're down. Don't let them out of the hospital until you've discussed this and make sure you document the discussion. Cardiac exercise rehab, again, discuss it with the patient, make the appointment. Even if they don't get there for a week or a month or, or months, make the appointment, okay? It reduces cardiac mortality. It's a very safe, safe thing to do. And if we don't do it, CMS is going to start denying our whole stay because this is going to happen in the future. Very important that we document this. Okay, <clears throat> a couple of simple things here. Changes in natural history. Over the course of the last 40 years, we've introduced antihypertensive therapy, followed by lipid lowering therapy in the 90s, followed by smoking policy reduction in, in, in the 2010s. What has that done to our landscape? Well, if you look at this, the overall burden of MI has dropped completely, and so has the amount of STEMI versus non-STEMI. They're now about equal, probably because of these changes that have occurred. So yes, we're doing better, but we still have the big problem of diabetes and the obesity epidemic, which is really gonna hit us hard in the next 20, 30, 40 years. I just want to talk for a second about this because it's interesting and I think potentially very useful. Um, Colcott was a study looking at giving a very simple drug, colchicine, after acute uh, ST elevation MI to patients at a half milligram a day and looking at their outcomes. The outcomes were, were influenced quite uh, dramatically by colchicine. The primary benefit was seen in the reduction of stroke and recurrent hospitalization for unstable ischemia. But for a very cheap drug um, that's very easy to take and very well tolerated, it had a pretty profound effect. And certainly a lot more profound than a much more expensive drug, which was seen in the Cantos trial, canakinumab, which was an IL-1B inhibitor, cost $16,000 a shot and is no longer available because they're not, more, they're not manufacturing it for this indication anymore. So this very cheap drug may turn out to be a very big boon to our, our therapy. Keep an eye on it. Um, I'm going to skip this for a moment and just to move on. What if you have stents and you need non-cardiac surgery? <clears throat> this is important to know. About one-fifth of our patients that get a stent eventually need cardiac surgery in the next two years, non-cardiac surgery. So it's important to remember that if you ask these patients before you put a stent in, are you planning on having anything done? Um, important to know that surgery within six weeks of a PCI, the MACE rates are one in 10. Okay, and even if you go out to six months, it only drops in half. 
Okay, so it's it's important to remember that this is not a benign process, and um, you know it requires the the input of an interventionalist and a clinical cardiologist to make a decision about when to do non-cardiac surgery. I just wanted to put this up for a second because we had a nice um, session with our friends in India, thanks to Dr. Latib, um, and they were talking about the STEMI system in India and how a lot of these patients are treated with a pharmacoinvasive strategy and then sent in for basically what we call a drip and ship. But what they noticed that a lot of their patients are younger, they were smokers, they had pretty large MIs and large clots, but after they lysed these patients, many of them had, quote, clean coronaries. And the presumed etiology of this is plaque erosion. So a lot of these patients are not being stented, they're being followed. And this paper is due out in circulation very soon, so keep an eye out for it. It should be very interesting to see, maybe changes our strategy with erosion, okay. Finally, what to do with oral anticoagulants and ACS. Um, you know, about six to eight percent of our PCI cases require long-term anticoagulation. We still use warfarin for mechanical valves, but for non-valvular AF, no acts are preferred because of the low bleeding risk. So here's a case. You have a 64-year-old lady, uh, permanent AFib, Chad score is two, non-STEMI. She comes in and she has left main intervention. So she got two DES involving the left main. How do you manage her therapy? What should we do? And these are the things that we wrestle with every day. What's her bleeding risk? What to do about her, her warfarin versus the NOAC? How long should we run this stuff for? So we can look at a HasBled score, which is now available on, on Epic. And her HasBled score in this particular patient is quite low. Again, takes into account some of these factors, adds up a point score. She's at a very low risk for bleeding. But because she's at a high thrombotic risk because of her anatomy. We fixed her left main. She's got two stents sitting in the left main. So low bleeding risk, high, high uh, potential for uh, thrombosis, we're gonna potentially extend her treatment um, beyond what we normally would do. So I'm gonna show you the money slide here. So she's in a high ischemic risk type of a uh, situation. So besides we do triple therapy with this patient, aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor and NOAC for one week in the hospital, okay? Move that here down to one month, okay? Because she's at high risk and then double therapy and then the NOAC alone after a year. What if you're in the default strategy? Your default strategy is triple for a week and then double and move on. And then your high bleeding risk strategy is again, triple for a week, double therapy here and then NOAC alone after six months. So this is sort of the money slide, but this is our daily, our daily conundrum. So to quickly summarize, last three slides, sudden cardiac death with STEMI, immediate angiography, revascularization, and hypothermia. Sudden death without STEMI, angiography, urgent, revascularization, targeted temperature management. Shock and STEMI, immediate hemodynamic support, immediate angiography, treat the infarct-related vessel, you don't revascularize all the other stuff. STEMIs immediate angiography and complete revascularization, and non-STEMI ACS, immediate or urgent angiography, depending on the, the risk category of that particular patient. Evaluate the clinical features. Um, intermediate and high-risk cases get early angiograms. Um, we also don't load with pre-2Y12 inhibitors for non-STEMIs as opposed to STEMIs. Stratify your bleeding versus ischemic risk using the clinical calculators. We use antithrombins and antiplatelet drugs to passivate the active lesions and guidelines-based medical therapy. And if you're not all in a coma by now, I'm sure you have a question or two. Please ask. <clears throat> Mark, thank you very much. Um, that was really an, an amazing talk, uh, very complete. And I think we covered uh, really everything you could imagine in ACS from diagnosis to risk stratification to mimics to to the management um, unfortunately we've run significantly over time so we i'm not sure how much time we'll have for questions we'll i'll maybe just pose to some of the questions from the participants rather than my own and if mara has any questions we'll let him also chime in so um the one question is uh from sadjo kaura who's a well-known interventional cardiologist he mentions that, and you showed the trial of complete STEMI, um, complete PCI, 
that we have strong, strong evidence for complete revascularization in STEMI, right? Uh, from that style, that trial and a, and a few other studies as well. Um, any thoughts about, uh, he asked, uh, complete, complete revascularization in end STEMI? And if so, over what time period should it be done? As I said, we don't have a good strategy because we, we really don't have trials to support that. So what we're doing in end STEMI is basically mimicking what we do in STEMI. Um, and I think that's, you saw that in the case that I showed of the patient with the out of hospital cardiac arrest, but um, <clears throat> we're basically using that data to, to guide us. So most people who are coming in, and, and again, most patients with end STEMIs, we find most of them do have multivessel disease. Um, we are adopting a complete revascularization strategy, not necessarily all the lesions all at once, um, but the, to follow the STEMI guideline, meaning do the, the culprit lesion and then within either the hospitalization or within 45 days, do the, you know, do the, the non-culprit um, lesions as well. Is there any data to support that? There's none. Uh, and, and, the, and the guidelines are pretty clear about that. Um, that will follow. I believe there are trials ongoing that are looking at this, but right now we're following the STEMI protocol for that. Okay, great, thanks. There's a question um, from one of the colleagues about, you know, you mentioned uh, P2Y12 inhibitors and the fact that now we have Frasagrum Tacagrelor, there's no need to give it in the emergency room in, in STEMIs until you know anatomy. So the colleague asked, what about Prasagril uh, for STEMI in the ED before, uh, before coronary anatomy is defined? But as I said, that it, it is actually indicated not only in the guidelines, but in clinical practice that we do give P2Y12 inhibitors uh, up front because it, it, I, can't, I can't even think of a situation with a true STEMI where we would not be doing an angioplasty. Even if, it, even if the patient has an occluded left main, we're still gonna be doing an angioplasty. So, it's unlikely that waiting is going to help uh, in those situations. And, you know, so we, uh, the, the, the routine here and in, in almost all centers has been to upfront load a P2Y12 inhibitor. And we've here chosen to use either Plavix or Ticagrelor as our default strategy, uh, depending on the patient and availability. So um, we are still doing that. And I think the guidelines support that. The, the uh, STEMI guidelines certainly support that. Well, great. Thank you. Um, another question from Jim Shua, um, who uh, Dr. Shua asks, any role for the Esselstyn diet post MI? And maybe before you respond to that, maybe for those of us who are not as familiar with different diets, uh, if you could explain what the Esselstyn diet is, please. Well, I, I was hoping Rob Osfeld was on the call <laughs> because he's been a big proponent of this. Um, the Esselstyn is a really a plant-based uh, program. It, it's not just a diet, but it's a whole lifestyle change. And uh, Rob Osfeld, who's our, our, our dear colleague, has been working on this for years, uh, has made tremendous inroads and actually brought Esselstyn here to speak some years ago about this, has set up a whole plant-based program, um, which is now available on both campuses for patients of ours who are coming in with acute coronary syndromes and want to change their lifestyle. And he also runs a, an outpatient program, which does the same thing. So I would say it's not part of the guidelines, but there is no reason not to have that discussion with a patient if you're comfortable doing it. Um, that clearly has made a difference in terms of even, quote, inoperable and incurable patients. Uh, and that's where Esselstyn kind of made his name, taking people that were rejects from surgery and, and, and cardiologists threw up their hands in despair and said, I can't help you anymore. And he took these people and, and actually, by changing their diets, changed their lives. All right. Um, another question that came up, which is a very good question, we can maybe briefly answer, uh, is what about STEMI, patients presenting late with STEMI? So, you know, within 24, 48 hours. Um, and really, the whole question about the open artery hypothesis, particularly in consideration of the OAT trial, um, which we know was negative, but had a lot of limitations yes. uh, in design and how the procedures were done. Um, should we be opening these arteries late? Yeah, we, we actually were one of the centers for the OAT trial as well. And the initial, the initial thinking behind that was based on animal models. Um, 
that showing that opening arteries even laid out um, prevented uh, aneurysm formation and death. That turned out not to be really true in, in patients. Um, there, there was some reduction in arrhythmic events in patients that had late opened arteries, but there was no real mortality change in these patients. And that was presented back in, I think, 2006 at the AHA. Um, so the, the, the guidelines would suggest that if you have ongoing symptoms, and that's actually shown in one of the slides that I showed you, but ongoing symptoms of ischemia, even laid out, meaning 48 hours, you're still indicated to go ahead and open that vessel uh, and do angioplasty. In a completely asymptomatic patient, um, there, the indication is not really there past 48 to 72 hours. The 48 to 72 is a little bit soft, um, but you know when you're really out past three days, and that's kind of the number we used in the O trial, the benefit is not there. Uh, we thought it would be, um, but and we were wrong. And, 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 and I think the trial proved that. Obviously, as you said, there were limitations to the trial, but that's kind of what the guidelines would suggest at this point. So rushing the patient to the cath lab at 72 hours, there's no real indication for that. It becomes more like a CTO. And then you have to have the indications for a CTO. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Greg, I'll, I'm going to do one last question, Mark, because uh, the questions are really coming in now, but I think we also need to conclude. Um, there's a question from Miguel Alvarez. Is, what is the role of coronary CTA in end STEMI um, in a large center like ours? Or what should the role be? Well, I think the, it was pretty clear in the guidelines that if you're coming in and you're actually making troponin, um, that there's probably not a significant role for CCTA uh, in a patient like that because you're having an acute event. It's the patients that are presenting with chest pain that sounds ischemic, but the EKG is not diagnostic, the enzymes are negative, but you're worried about that particular patient. You say, well, they may be having angina, I'm not sure. There's definitely a role for CCTA as a rule out. Um, and it's a very good way to rule out significant disease. Or to say, look, this patient does have disease and has calcification. They were on no treatment. Now I'm going to put them on lipid lowering drugs and aspirin. That's perfectly appropriate. But somebody ruling in, even with a troponin elevation, I think, unless Dr. Garcia can comment, but I don't think there is really a role for doing CCTA in that patient. Well, maybe what about the patient, you know, the, I guess the 40 year old patient woman who's postpartum and has a chest pain with an acute mm -hmm. coronary syndrome, where right. you suspect SCAD. Right. You think there may be a role there? Yeah, I think we, we have had this discussion within our group and I think other, others feel the same way as well. But if you really have a high suspicion of SCAD, and, and again, this, is a, this would be a much younger patient or somebody with a, with a risk factor for SCAD, the role here, then the, the reason for doing it as opposed to invasive angiography is it, it actually may be safer because you're not actually injecting a coronary and potentially propagating a, a tear or a, a dissection. Um, but you got to have a pretty high suspicion for SCAD to do that. Okay, great. Mario, any last comments before we close? He had to leave. Okay. Um, Mark, really, I, I'm going to go watch this on YouTube again because there was just so much information uh, there to take in. Um, it really was a, an excellent and really thorough talk on the topic, and I know how much work you put into it. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to all the participants for joining. Next week is a, a CT MRI uh, talk, and the week after we'll have one of our general cardiology talks again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Sorry I drowned you. <laughs> no, no, this is great. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay.